Hi, my name is Julie Roca, and I am an independent consultant and advisor in senior living. I am with a good friend of mine today, Kimberly Sullivan Avenger. I have to remember the Avenger part because she recently got married. And Kim has been working with me in the senior care industry for as long as I've been in the industry, and I know uh, much longer than that. So Kim, tell us what brought you to the senior care healthcare industry. Well, I started off actually in midwifery and going to school for that. Huh. What, <laughs> so a, what a definitely swap. Definitely different. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, started off actually at 18 taking a CNA class um, and then went off into midwifery. I've done multiple roles in the healthcare industry. So it's been about 23 years that I've worked in healthcare, and it's all actually been in geriatrics. I have done some midwifery um, as well, too, but I just love helping our geriatric population and working in long-term care. So I decided to stay in that role. Awesome. I think the first time I met you, actually, you had traveled to Alaska with uh, Scott, who is now your husband. And um, I remember hearing you talk about how somehow your work phone kept ringing while you were on the cruise to Alaska and you were able to help some seniors even then. And I thought, wow, this woman is way more dedicated <laughs> than I will probably ever be. Um, and But you truly do have a heart for helping seniors and helping them to navigate through some very difficult times. Some of the times when I think they most need help. Um, you have been there. So at this point, um, at where are you where are you located? What are you currently doing? So I work with Millennial Healthcare. We have multiple facilities around the state of Florida. And this area, we have Parklands Care Center, Williston Care Center, the Terrace, um, and um, Willis or Park Meadows. <laughs> yes. So mouthful. Um, but those are our local facilities. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, I get I get this phone call um, once a week, maybe, and uh, I'll have a frantic family member that says, mom or dad has fallen, and they're currently in the hospital, and I just, you know, we don't know exactly what to do next. Obviously, they can't go home. Um, they're going to need some sort of rehab. That will give us some time in order to uh, find the next step that we need to to take uh, to keep mom or dad safe in the home. And so that will be our plan. And um, they will work with a caseworker and they will send out a referral. And lo and behold, their insurance will come back and say, sure, you have 10 days of rehab, which you and I both know is going to be nowhere near enough to cover, uh, you know, someone who's had a, a bad fall and maybe has had some broken bones and they need to rehab or they need to build some strength up because they've been very sick or laying in bed for quite some time. So a lot of times I will then hang up the call there and call you because you are my expert <laughs> at this step. So explain what it is, how can you help from there? So if the patient is coming from the hospital, it depends on what type of insurance, of course, that they have. Mm -hmm. Um, Medicare, then we can kind of uh, keep them going on caseload as long as they're making progress. However, with the managed care plans, unfortunately, people don't understand when they purchase the managed care plans that they're actually getting a case manager at the managed care company that's telling us how long they can stay in the facility. So not the physician. Right. Um, And correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes it's even an algorithm that they're using. So it's not even a person saying, uh, yes, they deserve to have more care or not. It could just be an algorithm that they're using. Is that right? 
Well, for the most part, for what we have found, it's case managed. Case from, managed, okay. Mm-hmm. So there's normally always some sort of case manager that's assigned. Now, they may get auto-approved for the authorization that we put in online, okay. and that's probably the algorithm that you're thinking of, and then um, the case manager is assigned after that if it's a simple approval. Um, sometimes, though, if it's they think the patient's walking too far um, or something else is happening and they think they need to discharge home, then they'll assign it automatically to a case manager, and then they have to review it before they gotcha. get authorization from the hospital. And when you say walking too far, we're not talking miles. We're talking a number of steps, right? Right, yes. We've even seen um, you know, patients that are ambulating about uh, 75 feet that they're saying That's, that they need to go home from the hospital. Yep, I had one recently that um, – that it was 70 feet and uh, we weren't getting approval. So what specifically is it that you can do to help at that point? So what we can do if someone is needing to come in and they do actually get approval for, you know, this first seven days, um, we can talk to them about Medicaid. We Mm -hmm. also talk to them about going back to their regular traditional Medicare benefits Um, So that would entail um, me actually just, you know, switching that online. It's kind of simple um, into another prescription drug plan. And then that will take them out of the managed care plan and back to their traditional Medicare. Unfortunately, though, it's not effective immediately. It's effective the first of the month following the disenrollment. So if they're only covered for the seven days and then the case manager comes back and said, well, we think that they need to go home, then we have to look at a payer source for that in-between time. So there oh, is okay. yeah, there is a special election period when they come into a skilled nursing facility. Um, however, if they're looking to disenroll in the home environment, then that's only once a year normally. Right that's October. I was going to ask that. So the yes. special election comes because now they've had kind of an adverse life event. Mm-hmm. So they've got a very small window of time that they can make that switch or they have to wait. I think it's October, right? Correct. And then they can yeah. make those changes. So you said if we have to wait that window, for example, their 10 days is over, um, and let's say it is the 20th of May and their 10 days are over, and we have to wait until June 1st for those new funds to kick in, what payer sources are accepted? So we can talk about private pay if they do have funds. Um, They can pay privately just from the 20th to the 1st when we're disenrolling them. Or, you know, we can talk about Medicaid pending if they do not have those funds. Okay. Yeah, Mm -hmm. because some don't have those funds. Medicaid pending. I'm so glad you brought that up because I just had a call today. Um, Now a lady is completely through her, she had 30 days. Um, They're looking at a discharge in the next four days, and there has been no move to apply for the long-term care Medicaid. Um, Is that an overnight process, Kim? (laughs) No, I wish. (laughs) Oh, it is not. No. It, it's it's definitely a gathering process. Yes. Uh, we can help with that. Uh, is I mean, it can be overnight to tell them whether that we think that they'll qualify. Yeah. We're just asking, you know, simple questionnaires. Um, and then actually we'll go from there and gather the information with the help of a family member yes. and do the process for them in one of our skilled nursing facilities. Yeah. So um, even if you think... You might only need two months' worth of help or three months' worth of help. What day should we start looking into long-term care Medicaid if you don't have the funds to pay for that length of stay? What day should we start looking at that? Day one. (laughs) Day one. (laughs) In the hospital before you even come to the skilled nursing facility. So um, they should start, you know, asking those questions, whoever the hospital liaison, like I do, that comes to bedside and ask the, you know, some of the simple questions. Are you looking for short-term rehab or long-term care? How long do you think your stay is? And of yes. course, you know, stays happen to change frequently, um, mm-hmm. but we at least get that ball rolling so we know if someone's going to need longer. 
Yes. And a lot of times people do know that they're not going to have the funds. Um, If you're looking at uh, assisted living, you're looking at anywhere between 4,000 in Gainesville up to if you got a high level of care, you may be looking at closer to 10,000 for a really high level of care. And in skilled nursing, you're looking at anywhere between 8,500 a month, correct? Okay. On up to about 12,500, 13,000 in the Gainesville area. And it, and it can vary in other areas. So if uh, if someone is looking at finances and says, I'm not going to have that, um, they need to be calling. Uh, they need to be calling me. Um, they need to be having a conversation with the caseworker at the hospital. Um, if they're starting to talk to a skilled nursing facility, they need to be talking to the admissions director and saying, help me. I don't have the funds for this. And we need to get those long-term care Medicaid waivers in the works Correct. so that we can make sure to give them the proper care for the longer time. Um, I, I love this conversation. And sometimes we've got family members that are uh, sitting with a loved one at home and they're a high level of care. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe there's a UTI that they can't seem to get on top of. Maybe there's a bed sore that they have had somebody coming in from home health and they can't get on top of it. What can they do? Do they have to take their loved one to a hospital? Can they call a skilled nursing facility and admit from home? Tell us about that. Okay. Yes, they can definitely admit from home. We do need to get paperwork either from their primary care physician or the other hospital setting, say they've been in the hospital recently in the last 30 days. Uh, There is a 30-day window if they were in the hospital that they can come into a skilled nursing facility if they're Medicare um, and still go under their regular Medicare benefits. Um, If they haven't had that 30-day, then the last 30 days stay, then what they can do is come in under private pay or if they're home under, you know, a hospice setting, they can come in in under hospice respite. So we can talk about all the different payers because everyone is different. Okay, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, you mentioned the hospice respite. Um, mm-hmm. That is a fantastic benefit of hospice and can be used. I've seen families use that when uh, when their loved one needs to go have surgery. So if the caregiver needs a surgical procedure, okay. they can't leave their loved one at home alone. So they do have that hospice, Medicare, Medicaid um, ability to put them in under a respite period. And sometimes that turns into longer care. So you can Mm -hmm. have that conversation once they get there um, or on that first day. It's a conversation to have on the first day. Um, And uh, and that's, that's a beautiful benefit of hospice. There are managed Medicaid plans, too, depending on if the patient has a community Medicaid plan that will sometimes offer respite benefits as well, too, and we can bring them home from home on the waiver from the managed Medicaid. Okay. Mm-hmm. How long is that respite usually? So normally they're, they do a very short period of time, okay. a week, um, maybe 10 days. It depends okay. on what the patient's actually needing, what's going on at home, what's going okay. on with, you know, the family member. But then we can convert it and do um, ICP Medicaid application if needed, if the patient needs to stay longer. Yes. And, mm-hmm. and I find that a lot of times that the patient does need to stay longer, that, you know, if their caregiver it needs a surgical procedure done, they may ne- also need time in rehab in order to get back to being healthy enough to care for their loved one. So that's an awesome benefit. And again, that's sort of difficult to navigate through if you don't know how. But if you've got an expert that can help you walk through it, it, it it's awesome. It's a Absolutely. wonderful And I'm benefit. always on call 24-7, yes. as you know. <laughs> yes. And, um, and you can reach Kim if we need her through me. So again, mm-hmm. I'll leave a link um, a way that you can reach out to me, an email address. Um, you can comment it, that you would like us to reach out to you, and we will. Um, and then I another question that I have here is, how do I get my family out of managed 
care? Does it have to be through you? And I guess you kind of answered this already. It does have to be at a life-altering event. We can do that. There is a list when you go in online to disenroll someone or add a prescription drug plan, and it asks, you know, different events. There is a list of different questions on there, and you can choose what's actually going on with the patient. Say they right. moved out of the zip code that they were in before, that's a life-changing event. Okay. Um, coming into a skilled nursing facility, and there's several other questions, too, that okay. can put them in that special election period. Okay. Awesome. That's so good to know. Um, and, you know, the managed care and the regular Medicare plan, um, people often ask, well, why in the world would someone do the managed care plan? Because at the end of the day, it, you know, if you're healthy, it makes a lot of sense, right? right. I guess. Um, as soon as you start to have more physical issues cropping up, that might be the time to start looking at, hey, I might need to move out of this managed care plan and get back into a, just a regular Medicare plan. Traditional Medicare. The traditional Medicare plan. Correct. And it depends, too. Every, of course, every case is different. Um, if they have a supplement for Medicare, um, if they don't have a supplement, mm -hmm. how much the premiums that they have budgeted for that they're willing to pay. So I try and start that conversation with everyone and go through uh, just to kind of see where where they're at financially and whether it's going to benefit them to change into the traditional Medicare. Yeah. A lot of the times it does when they're coming into a skilled nursing facility simply because of the copays that start if they don't have a supplement. Uh, then when they go back to the community, I tell them that we can always put them back into their managed care plan after we've disenrolled them. They have the 30-day window to go back to the managed care plan. Okay. Too. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. That's great to know. Well, Kim, I really appreciate your coming on here. These are a lot of questions that I get on a regular basis that people want answers to. And so I really appreciate you being here. Uh, to our listeners at home, if you have any other questions, um, I can have Kim back on to answer questions. So please drop some questions uh, that you want to see answered. And um, we can always have Kim back. Um, and I can always get a hold of Kim and ask those questions quickly if we need to, if you don't have the time to wait. And a lot of times we don't. Um, and Kim, I can't wait to have you back on again some other time to answer those questions. Thank yes. you for coming. Thank you for having me, Julie.